thankful for that. But uh, tonight I'm going to open up in prayer. I'm going to pray from, okay, where is it? Uh, Psalm 119, uh, 17 through 24. It says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. You rebuke the arrogant and the cursed who wander from your commandments. Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimonies. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. And so, Lord, tonight we thank you for uh, this beautiful subject of education, of passing on the testimony of the Lord. And we just acknowledge that our soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances all times, Lord, that we long for you, for you to come and to teach us. We thank you that you are the anointing within us to teach us all things, Holy Spirit. And so I thank you for how you are uh, just disseminating this information, sharing this information with every uh, person. And uh, our ears are open. And we ask you tonight, David's prayer, we say, open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your law. For we are strangers in the earth, but we thank you that you call yourself a sojourner in your own land and that you invite us to walk with you. And so do not hide your commandments from us as we review these things, as we review uh, the feasts and the blueprints of the feast for passing on the testimony of the Lord. Just ask that you would open our eyes, give us living understanding and wisdom that we may meditate on your statutes, that they may become our delight. And from the place of delight, Lord, that we would learn and that this information would go deep. And I ask you to open doors in hearts and minds to explore these things further for generations to come. And so we thank you that you are a beautiful God, that you're an infinite, with infinite wisdom, that your head is and hair are white as wool, and that you will never be exhausted of of truth. You'll never be exhausted of beauty. You'll never be exhausted of glory. And you are eternally capable of constantly and perpetually fascinating our hearts with uh, just the beauty of your word. And so we ask you to come and teach us tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Well, um, like I said, I'm going to get started. I'm going to, so tonight, I don't have my... uh, syllabus schedule up here, but pretty much we're going to be going over. There's another handout, uh, which I believe everyone has, session two. Um, and so just as a review, I'm just going to start by reading through the review section. I may not read all the portions just for the sake of time. Um, it's going to be sensitive to what the Lord has. So if I might just say, okay, like you can kind of go back and read this section or highlight different sections, but I do want to, at the end of this uh, session, before we t- do the Q&A, um, I want to talk about the other handout in more detail, which is implementing the feast education model at SATHOP. So I passed that out last time. There might be like one more copy in the back, but yes, Sharon has it. Um, oh, someone's done her homework. All right. <laughs> um, But the reason why I want to talk about this is this is, for our direct community, this is what we're doing, right? And and you're kind of kind of be like, oh, that makes sense. No, duh, you know? Um, But like I said last last week, many times we're already doing the things because the Lord is faithful. He's already leading us in them. We just don't know how to tell other people why we're doing it (laughs) or, or what is it. So he... We follow him out of obedience, and then he brings us understanding. And I personally think it goes that way because, one, he always wants to preserve trust. He always wants to preserve that relationship of trust. And our tendency is that if we get the information before the trust is necessary, we'll never trust, and we'll actually trust in the information and not him. And so he, he always keeps us leaning, but he does give us understanding. It says in Proverbs that understanding comes from his mouth and that out of all our getting, all our gaining, we should gain understanding. So Jesus, we ask you for understanding tonight. Um, but I'm just gonna start reading. So um, in response is a review from last class. In the previous class, we discussed what is a spiritual city or a city built by God. 
We learned that in a spiritual city, everything is built by the spirit and connected to the living God through communion with him. In a spiritual city, all education is passing down the testimony of the Lord. This includes teaching the next generation math, science, history, music, art, etc. In a spiritual city, math and science are spiritual subjects as long as the teachers are teaching these subjects from the testimony of the Lord and the presence of the Lord is welcome in the classroom. Because we are using the feast as our blueprint to explore how the Lord wants us to educate the next generation, it is important that we know how to interpret the feast in light of the eternal priesthood. If we interpret the feast incorrectly, we'll end up building education systems in the flesh that the Lord will have to tear down again. We desire an education model that cannot be shaken. It is for this reason that we discussed in the previous class how to interpret and apply the feasts as priests according to the order of Melchizedek. We first discussed how the feasts were an appointed time of visitation from God to his people. Under the Levitical priesthood, these times of visitation were constrained to the earthly elements of space, matter, and time. However, under the priest of Melchizedek and through the changing of the law, we have perpetual access both individually and corporately to the presence of God through the cross of Christ. This changes how we interpret the way we fulfill the feast, which ultimately affects the way we use the feast as a blueprint for exploring education in a city built by God. We no longer view the feast through carnal lenses, but through eternal Holy Spirit lenses. The feasts provide the prophetic map for how God visits and relates to his people, depending on where they are at their conical, on their conical redemptive path up Mount Zion. The feasts serve as God's prophetic education plan for maturing his people into the fullness of Christ. Under the Levitical priesthood, these appointed times of visitation were tied to the lunar and agricultural cycles. But under the new covenant, God's prophetic clock is not based on earthly dates, times, and seasons, but is based on the testimony of the one who sits on the throne. We discern this testimony through our living and active relationship with the Holy Spirit. Education in a city built by God is always connected to the living and active testimony proceeding from the eternal throne in heaven. This testimony is communicated by the Spirit of God as God's people seek the Lord the feasts provide the grid for how we are to posture our hearts before him based on how he is visiting us. So with that said, let's look at the seven key components, which is going to be what tonight is about. And these are very practical. This is a very uh, practical teaching. So we're going to get into the practical application of the feasts in regards to educating the next generation. So with a solid foundation laid for how to interpret and apply the feasts as new covenant priests, we can now discuss how the feasts serve as a model for how to educate the next generation in a city that's built by the Lord. I have come to call this education model the feast education model. I believe this model touches education in the home as well as education in the community. The purpose of all education in a city built by God is to pass down the testimony of the Lord to the next generation and grow them up into the fullness of Christ. The feasts of the Lord provide us wisdom for how the Lord desires to shape the next generation, starting with the family dinner table at home. And this is really important. Uh, and this is what I want you to take away from both of these sessions, is that we're not talking just about you know education in the church. We're, we're talking about a, a type and a pattern, a seed that can be planted in any soil, right? Your home, church, workforce, uh, whether you're discipling two or three people or whether you're, you know, have a mega church or whatever. <laughs> um, but it's the seed that we're identifying from these sessions. And so uh, with that said, there are seven key components of the Lord's feast that provide insight into how the Lord desires us to pass down the testament of the Lord to the next generation. These key components are show below. Number one is Sabbath. Number two, past, present, and future. Number three, family instruction. Four, community celebration. Five, the communion meal. Six, worship. And seven, prophetic acts. And so this is, each of these components is what we're going to be exploring tonight. Um, in a city built by God, nothing is severed from relationship with his spirit and word, including education. As we study how the feasts inform us how to pass down the testament of the Lord to the next generation, keep in mind that all seven educational components of the feasts are analyzed in light of a living and active relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
Education in a city built by God is not a static curriculum disconnected from the leadership of the Spirit. It is instead a dynamic learning process that is always responsive to the present and active testimony of the Lord in that community. With that said, let's begin our study. So the first component that we will be studying is Sabbath. Sabbath is not just a recurring theme throughout the feast. It is considered a feast itself in Leviticus 23.3. Sabbath was observed during the feast in the following ways. And so I'm not going to read through every one of these, but you can see there we have the, it's discussed in the Passover in leavened bread. It's discussed in a feast of first fruits, feast of weeks, feast of trumpets. It had a lot of significance in the day of atonement. <laughs> The Lord actually uh, promised to destroy anyone who did any work on that day. Um, so it was really important. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, it was uh, kept on the first and eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So anyways, it's a recurring theme throughout the feast. And there's the scripture references if you guys want to go back and uh, uh, confirm. But the Sabbath is, one of the, is, is the one feast of the Lord that is common between every believer and Christian community who walks in the Spirit. And I provided the link if you guys went. I know, Sandra, you said you were asking about Sabbath uh, last week. And you may have come to Sadhop after. But I had taught a sermon last year on Sabbath. And that link right there is to that sermon. If you want to uh, explore that further. Um, The Sabbath is our connection to the eternal heart of God. And is our perpetual visitation with the Lord. Sabbath is the appointed time with heaven that we are to walk in 24-7 that allows us to discern how the Lord is visiting us and our community in more specific ways. Keeping Sabbath is literally the difference between life and death. When we don't keep Sabbath, our connection to life gets choked and we are subject to respond to the will of men and demons instead of the Lord's. Violating Sabbath is how true prophets become false prophets. On the contrary, keeping Sabbath is how we come into agreement with the Spirit's specific operation in our life and community. Keeping Sabbath means posturing our entire being around His presence. Our responsibility to keep Sabbath is to preserve our ability to respond to His presence. Sabbath is how the branch stays connected to the vine and bears fruit that remains. So it's pretty important. (laughs) When we keep Sabbath, our hearts are able to respond to the Lord in whatever way He wants to visit us is far too easy to let familiarity and routine rob us of the glorious reality that when we gather, we are coming before the Lord to visit with God and to respond to his throne, his presence, and his spirit in our midst. Whether you're coming before the Lord in your personal devotion time, gathering around the family table during dinner, or assembling as a community during worship service, are you keenly aware that you're coming before the Lord to respond to him? Is everything you do done with the awareness that you're in the presence of the Lord? We can celebrate the feast annually, yet never fulfill them unless we are able to keep Sabbath and sink our hearts, souls, and minds with the movements of his spirit. How does keeping Sabbath influence the way we educate our children? Education both in and outside the church has focused around passing the test instead of cultivating a desire to learn. We all know the typical school experience of studying for a test, taking the test, and then dumping the information from our minds after the test, (laughs) right? Yes. (laughs) Growing up, I was blessed to be homeschooled with a classical education. Although I was required to finish all my assignments by the end of each day, my mom allowed us to sit as long as we wanted with a subject or read ahead on something that really piqued our interest. We did have tests, but the learning emphasis was not on the test. It was on the subject. As a result, I learned to enjoy and love learning, and I still do. I actually fell in love with math, science, and music because I was given the freedom of being able to respond to the desires of my heart as I learned these subjects. Because I learned with delight, my heart was opened up, and I was able to soak up the information and instruction with lasting understanding. Many adults discover that they actually love to read later in life when they have the freedom to read for pleasure instead of obligation. Right? I've seen this happen all the time. Like the worst readers become, I mean, the best readers when they get older. They're like, oh, this thing is great. Why didn't I love to do this in high school? Well, um, God's heart for us keeping Sabbath is that we would learn to delight in him. Let's see Isaiah 58, uh, 
verses 13 through 14. It says, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my, my, on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. And so the takeaway from this is that there is a discipline in keeping Sabbath. We have to put all other things aside and give our mind, our heart, and body fully available to respond to him. The Sabbath is holy and consecrated for enjoying God and resting in him from distraction, sin, etc. When our children go to school, they're expected not to bring their toys with them into class. The class is consecrated for learning. When our children are doing devotional time at the family dinner table, they are free from running around and watching TV because the dinner table is consecrated for family devotion and fellowship. The same goes for worship service. The idea is that although kids enjoy playing with toys and running around, when it comes to learning school or learning about God, that learning process is consecrated and free of distraction so that all their faculties can be given to fall in love with the subject whether the subject be math or God himself. With Sabbath learning, there is consecration from distraction coupled with the discipline to give ourselves to the teacher. It is not supposed to be drudgery, but delightful. It is hard to learn effectively and develop passion for a subject when you're not at rest. When the heart is allowed to breathe and receive the material, the material goes deep and a true desire for the material is deposited. This starts a learning process that doesn't stop with high school or college, but lasts for eternity. We will forever behold his beauty and inquire in his temple. The new covenant reality is that God would put his laws into our minds and write them on our hearts. First, it is hard to have laws written on our hearts when we are not still and at rest. Second, God's heart is not just to fill us with information to pass the test. He wants to teach us, shape us, and transform us through imparting his law to our mind and heart within Sabbath rest. When our hearts are touched with the material, there is a response of affection and love for the material. King David is the one who says in Psalm 119, 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. He then says in the following verses that he understands more than the aged and has more insight than all his teachers because he has learned to keep God's word from the Lord himself. The Lord himself was the teacher. Teaching our children within Sabbath rest allows our children to cultivate a desire for the law of God, to ponder, to wonder, and to grow in appreciation for what they are learning and who, most importantly, right, who they are learning. Finally, curiosity and questions spring out of a heart that is at rest and is given the time and space to wonder, ponder, and meditate on the material. We observe this phenomenon in the book of Exodus when the Lord is commanding his people how to pass down the testament of the Lord to their children within the feast of Passover. Exodus 12, 24 through 27 and Exodus 13, 8 through 15 are quoted below. And I'm just for the sake of time, I'm gonna zero in on just the kind of the bold sections are right before it. But it says, when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And then in Exodus 13, it says, Therefore you shall keep, turning the four lines down, Therefore you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. And in bold, it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And then it continues to share their testimony. So I find it is interesting that the Lord in Exodus 12 and 13 emphasizes when your son asks you in time to come. Very interesting. He doesn't tell the parents to tell their children on their own accord why they are doing what they are doing. Instead, he expects the children to observe and learn from a place of curiosity according to their individual heart responses. Finally, as we pass on the testimony of the Lord in the home, the assembly, or on the way between, it is important to remember Sabbath. Consecrate time and space for learning, which is at rest from distraction, and cultivate desire and delight for the material. So, just before we go on to the next section, Sabbath 
you'll see it's gonna, we're gonna revisit, not directly, but it, everything's connected to that. <laughs> so like I said, I gave the picture last week of, if you think of a wheel, like an old fashioned, like chariot wheel, right? Sabbath is the hub and all these other components. Even if you look at Sabbath within the feast, like it is the central feast and all the other feasts branch out from Sabbath. They're all just expressions and it makes sense because if you look at Sabbath as the connection between the branch and the vine, the fruits being the different expressions of the Lord's heart through the other feasts are only coming, can only work as that central connection, that hub is there. And so that's basically kind of give you a visual for Sabbath. Um, okay, so in this next section too, it's pretty short, but this is basically why we have history. <laughs> Past, present, and I guess forecasting too, but past, present, and future. So this is number two component in, that we find in the feast. So the second key component of the feast in regards to education is the importance of focusing on the past, present, and future testimony of the Lord. For example, some of the feasts, such as Passover and 11 bread, spoke to things the Lord had done. The feasts were a way of fulfilling Psalm 78's mandate to not forget God's strength and the wondrous works which he had done historically. They served as memorials. For example, in Exodus 12, 26 to 27, the Lord tells the parents that when the children ask what the Passover and unleavened rites mean, they are to respond. We just read this. It's a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. So additionally, the Feast of Weeks for the Jewish people traditionally corresponded to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. The Feast of Tabernacles, according to Leviticus 23, 43, was so the generations to come may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. The children learned God's history in the context of celebrating the memorial feasts. Every healthy spiritual community should incorporate educational methods that pass down the prophetic history of the Lord that is applicable to that specific community. And this obviously applies on a micro level and a macro level. Like we learn about American history. We learn about Texas history. We learn about San Antonio history. We learn about your own family history, right? So it's not just, but it, it, the point is like here at Sad Hop, and we're going to discuss this in the questions, but is like, how are we doing an aspect of communicating the testimony of the Lord in our own house to the next, to the kids? Do they know why we exist? Do they know why, what brought Sad Hop into being? Do they know the prophetic history? Like uh, IHOP has done a really good job of that. They have an eight, you know, CD that actually is what helped bring me to the Lord was listening and hearing about their history. It was like, wow, God, you do this today? Like, I want to be a part of this, right? So it's really powerful is just the testimony and the history of the Lord. Um, and, it's, and it's a vital part of uh, maintaining the health and posterity of the community. So, um, second paragraph, the feast did not just teach the children what God had done, but they also spoke to what he was doing in the present. For example, the day of atonement had serious implications for individuals in the present, as well as for the entire community. Um, Leviticus sixteen twenty nine it says, this shall be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month on the 10th day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who served sojourns among you, for it is on this day atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So, as I mentioned previously, in a city built by God, education is never static. It is always connected to the living, active, and present testimony of the Lord, because it's an active time of visitation. So, you know, every time we get together on a Saturday night, we are living this out. We are discerning what is the Lord doing in this moment. If we only stuck to a script, right, we're no longer engaging the living God. We are, we just created a, a form of religion. Um, but when we teach and get up and teach, right, Dave is talking about, you know, he could be talking about the, you know, different scripture verses that talk about things God has done. But then the next question is, well, how does that pertain to what God is doing? And the third thing that we're going to talk about is, what does that mean for what's God going to do? Um, so lastly, all the feasts, including the memorial feast, served as prophetic parables to prepare the hearts of the Israelites for the Messiah to come. As mentioned previously, the first three feasts were fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ, and the last three have yet to be fulfilled in earth, time, and space. In regards to education in a spiritual community that is interested in passing down the testimony of the Lord, we can learn from the feast that God's heart 
for educating the generations to come is to meditate and celebrate what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, this education model of eating the whole lamb prepares the next generation to have prophetic vision to discern how the Lord is moving in their generation and the generations to come. We will discuss at the end of this class how we implement this education model practically as a community. All right, any questions so far before we uh, move forward? Going good? Okay. (laughs) You know, yeah, well, yeah, I'm using using the language of the Passover where they had to eat the whole lamb, so, yeah. In other words, we have to consume all of who Christ is. We can't pick out the parts that we like and leave the parts. Yeah, yeah. I've never eaten a whole lamb before, so I don't know what that would be like, like in a physical lamb. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, okay, so next is, this is really important, and something that I've emphasized here, especially at the beginning of this year, is family instruction and fathering. So one of the most important takeaways from the feast in regards to educating the next generation is the importance of family instruction. And uh, the most probably important verses to illustrate this is Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 9. So it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall... Be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. There are four activities mentioned in this passage. Sitting down in the house, walking by the way, lying down and rising up. I don't know about you, but that commandment doesn't give parents a break. (laughs) It's got you fully employed all the time. Um, It seems to imply that children are there all the time. Why? I don't believe the Lord's heart in training our children was to give them information and leave them to struggle with it while we do our own thing. The Lord desires for our children to walk with us in life, to invite them into our walk with God, and to teach them the commandments as we walk them out ourselves. As we discussed in the previous section, in both Exodus 12 and 13, it is the children who ask, what does this right mean? And what is this? It is interesting that these two verses command the parents to tell the children what the activities mean after the children ask. The parents' obedience to keep the Lord's commandments stir the children to ask their parents questions and thereby gain greater understanding. The practice begot the instruction. There is a difference between fathers and teachers. Teachers give students information and instructions to execute. On the other hand, a father lives out the instruction, empowers his children to do it with him, and then provides understanding to his children as they mature and ask questions. Last year, I felt like I hit a wall with teaching the the kids here at Sadhop. After seeking the Lord for understanding, the Holy Spirit shared with me that kids don't learn with typical step-by-step methods. They learn by observing and doing. I believe this is how the Lord always desired for us to learn. He doesn't want to give us a 12-week course on healing the sick. He invites us to walk with him in healing the sick and then tells us to go do it ourselves. After we try and do it our own and fail, we come back to him and ask more questions. And this is the process that, his education process that he likes. The understanding and instruction follow the practice. We can't expect our children to pray if we don't pray. We can't expect them to sing the Bible if we're not courageous to sing the Bible ourselves not just in church, but at home, around the table, and along the way. What is also interesting is that the Passover and 11 bread feasts were not just something God did a long time ago for the Israelites. It was a fresh and personal testimony of deliverance, as it says in Exodus 13.8. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. The Lord's heart is that the word is made flesh in our own life and house. His word, works, and praises which are passed down are not just the historical ones he did in the Bible days. They are to be personal and present in our own lives. Our testimony in God is our children's spiritual inheritance. What is the testimony of the Lord that you and your spouse carry in the Lord? Are you inviting your children to walk with you in that space? And are you giving them the space for their hearts to respond with questions? 
I believe it is the Lord's heart for the family unit to be the primary place of educating the next generation. But here's the thing. This doesn't work if Sabbath is not kept. We can't pick and choose parts of the word to practice. The sum of his word is truth. We have to submit all areas of our life to his word in order to experience the blessing of other parts of his word. Sabbath is a real issue for our nation. We live in a culture that values busyness and sees utilization and productivity as success. Lack of contentment fuels so many people's pursuits and efforts. The excuse of I don't have the time is never valid. We have time, we just don't know what is worthy to say yes to and what is unworthy to say no to. We love the idea of walking with our children, but are we willing to mark things off our calendar and create space to sit down with our children and impart our testimony in the Lord to them? If we want the blessings the Bible promises, we have to be willing to surrender everything. Abundant life only comes with complete surrender to his entire word. Okay, and then we're gonna do community celebration. I'm just gonna give like a two minute breather break, okay? (laughs) So the fourth educational component of the feast is community celebration. Community celebration was a key component of the feast as shown below in Deuteronomy 16, 10 through 15. And I'm gonna read the bold sections of this, but it says, then you shall celebrate the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand which you shall give just as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite who is in your town and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst in the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. And then go down to the uh, next bold section. And it says, and you shall rejoice in your feast." You and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. Seven days you shall celebrate a feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you and all your produce and all your work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. So although males were the only ones, they were the only ones commanded to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast, which is in Deuteronomy 16, 16, In Deuteronomy 16, the whole family was welcome to rejoice before the Lord for the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Booths. So although the family wasn't required, they weren't required by law to travel up to the Jerusalem for Passover, we know from Exodus 12 and 13 that God desired the children to ask questions as they watched their parents do the Passover rituals. Therefore, I would say it's safe to assume that God was very willing for the whole family to come celebrate together as long as it was feasible, right? In the previous section, we focused on how children are instructed and taught in the family union. However, as we study the feast, we see the Lord's heart for families gathering with other families to rejoice before the Lord so that children learn from their family within the greater family of God. The command in Psalm 78 to pass down the testament of the Lord to the next generation is not just a command to parents, but to the community as a whole. It is the community's responsibility to preserve their posterity by teaching the next generation the praises of the Lord, his strength and the wonderful works he has done. If you're interested in learning more about the community's assignment to teach the next generation, um, I gave the link to uh, my sermon, Posterity, which focuses on that subject. Um, So why is community celebration vital for community education? Who has fond memories of the holidays, right? Maybe, I don't know. That could be a touchy subject. <laughs> it's either got really bad or really good, and it, but it applies for the same reason, right? Um, the sounds, the smells, and the tastes they usually stand out to us, right? We usually remember that. Why do you think? Those memories carry with us for such a long time, whether they are positive or they're negative. When we create a celebratory environment for instruction to take place, positive emotions and experiences help seal in the heart and mind important truths. So instructions get more embedded in the heart and mind when it's combined with sensory and kinetic activities. Also, music and rhythm are powerful elements for sealing instruction because they activate the entire brain. Um, Author Julie Meyer uh, confirms this in her book, Singing the Scriptures, which uh, is actually, it was a class that I taught it uh, for a while. Um, But it says, she says in her book, when you listen to music or play an instrument, The activity causes different parts of the brain to work together. Adding words to the music strengthens the mix. 
Words come from the left side of the brain. Applying those words to music happens in the right side of the brain. The joining of them rhythmically in song comes from the back of the brain. And the front of the brain contributes the emotional reaction to the music. So you can see that singing God's words, right? They activate and they literally incorporate your entire brain. Which, when you think of the scripture in James where it says, you know, cleanse your minds, you double-minded. Well, one of the reasons with double-minded is you got one part of your brain that's saying this is right, but the other side of your brain, which has the stored emotional experiences where you live from your gut feeling, is uh, been wired opposite. And so you're literally split-brained. And so the way that you unite your brain together is actually singing the truth, but combining the emotional aspect. And so those emotional negative emotions get dumped. They get dumped into your, literally your physical body where they exit out your body and your body releases positive emotions that then get that understanding in your cells. I mean, that's the Lord made us beautifully. It's pretty crazy. Um, with that said, though, Paul, he also teaches us in Colossians 3, 16 through 17, and in Ephesians 5, 18 through 21, that singing the scriptures to one another is an effective way to get filled with the Spirit, discern the will of God, and teach one another. The Lord intends for our children to learn his commandments, his praises, and his presence by rejoicing together as a community through engaging all the senses in the spirit of celebration. I believe God has put into each of our hearts a longing for a feast. The purpose of our time here on earth is to prepare ourselves for his wedding feast. In Matthew 22, 1 through 14, Jesus begins the parable by comparing the kingdom of heaven to a king who gives a wedding feast for his son. Teaching our children in the context of community celebration is preparing them for their eternal calling as priests who minister to the Lord. Instruction is not meant to be boarding, boring, but exciting and celebratory. In Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra teaches the law to all the people who are gathered. As he is reading, all the people are mourning in response to hearing the words of the law. But listen to what the people are commanded to do by their leaders in Nehemiah 8. It says, then Nehemiah, this is verses 9 through 12 of Nehemiah 8. Then Nehemiah, who is the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved." All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. The people are sent away to eat, drink, and celebrate a great festival in response to understanding the law. So understanding was celebrated. Holiness wasn't considered somberness and stuffiness, as it can be typically understood. But instead, verse 10 reads, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Celebration, rejoicing, and feasting was paired with learning and understanding God's law. As a community, how are we pairing community celebration with teaching God's commandments to the next generation? It is a real concern for parents that their children would find church enjoyable so that when they grow up, they don't leave the church because of bad church experiences. In light of what we've been discussing, this is a legitimate concern. However, many times the solution parents reach for to respond to this concern misses the mark. We don't have to entertain our children with toys and games, distract them with phones, or give them recreational activities to make church a positive experience for them. In fact, quite opposite. We need to teach them Sabbath, that the light in the Lord comes as we rest from selfish desires and instead consecrate ourselves fully to him so that we can discover our heart's true delight in him. If we want our children to enjoy the Lord in his house, the first step is teaching them Sabbath. The second step is to model celebration for them ourselves in the privacy of our own home. We can't expect them to enjoy the Lord in the sanctuary when we are bored with God in our own homes. If we want our children to enjoy God in church, we need to learn to delight in the Lord ourselves and then create a space for our children to walk with us in that reality, starting at our own dinner table and in our own family room. The last step is a community assignment. We as a community need to learn to celebrate the Lord and rejoice in him together, as well as create a safe space for our children to participate with us. There is a time to be sober, sit down and listen, but there's also a time to dance, rejoice, and celebrate. 
When we step out of our comfort zone as adults, right, to worship and celebrate, we create a wave for our children to ride on. It's funny, since Doree's here, I actually remember one of the first things that I saw Doree do when we were at the Broadway location. <laughs> She's like, what are you going to say? Um, but I remember being in this worship one night, and the kids, we didn't have any kind of kids' ministry at that point, but the, they were just in the back, and she got one of the flags, and she got like a parade going around the room <laughs> with all the kids. And I, anyways, I just came to mind right now as modeling and inviting the kids to join us in that, in that celebratory spirit with instruction. So um, I'm going to give just, a, just like a two-minute, if you want to get a two-minute water break, I'm going to get my water real quick. And then we will uh, we'll resume at uh, number five, the communion meal. <laughs> 